Hello everyone, this is Martha Lynn Allen over at the Silver River Museum. Here's a quick video we did of Robert Wilson's presentation this summer. I hope you all enjoy it. Thanks. changed pretty much everything that the Indians were familiar with. One of the things they left was the cattle and the horses. And we'll get into what the importance of that is, but I wanted to illustrate that they were the ones that brought the cattle and the horses to Florida. As you can see, this is what it was like when we became a territory. These were already states of the United States. So we had Florida's territory, Mexico, of course, belonged to Mexico. Then we had this up here, it was all still open to become territory. And 
And I'm going to give you a little idea what went on here, but next one. <clears throat> of course, if you're going to go into an area, and believe me, you didn't have to, there wasn't one particular way. There was plenty of individuals that came into Florida that basically had their haversack, their gun, a few things that they needed to come in, some tools to work with so they could establish a place to live. Then you had other people that brought lots of stuff, as you can see, the different types of tools. Everything you could bring with you made your job easier, hopefully. And then if you could bring people with you, brothers, uh, kids, wife, etc. Of course, you had to have a wagon. So think about this, the wagons back then at that time would run you about 100 bucks. Today, that's $2,000 in today's money, okay? To equip that wagon out with everything you needed, it was going to be over a thousand. That's twenty thousand dollars in today's money. So you had to really want to take a chance on your investment. You got to realize a lot of people lived up in the states, and when they knew it became a territory, that gave them the ambition and, of course, the drive because now they can own more land. They could still keep what they had up there, leave it with family, but yet come into Florida as a territory and get new land. And then there was other reasons they came in too. All right, so during this period here, it put a damper on it because the Indians, you realize from the time it became a territory, people were coming in, Indians weren't happy about that because they were still here. They considered it their land. Of course, there was different treaties and the treaties had been uh, broke. They weren't negotiated properly. So during the Second Seminole War, you had to be really brave to come in here and try to settle, and some people did, and successfully. They managed to survive, but there was quite, quite a few people that lost their lives that uh, were coming into Florida during this period here. Now this one, when the war was over, uh, they had tried to come up with a method, and actually, the Romans had done this in Gaul. They had enticed some of their soldiers to stay where they had conquered by giving them land. They did it in West Virginia, too. They enticed people to stay in hostile territories by having them armed, and then they would give them land in trade. So our Armed Occupation Act here went through Congress. Didn't go over well at first, but then they managed to uh, present it in such a manner. And what they would do is they entice people to come down here, move into the territory, because the Indians had been moved out to Oklahoma, the well, few ones here had moved down south towards the Everglades, and they determined most of the north part of Florida was uh, occupied well up by Tallahassee all across the Panhandle, and to get people to come further south, they promised them they could have 160 acres of land. If they moved in, they were armed, they had to uh, basically improve five acres over five years. And the government said, we'll give you, well, they had promised when they first did this act that there would be a year of provisions and possibly loan you more guns and ammunition to make you successful because they figured the most people they could get in, then the quicker the few Indians that were left would decide to go out to Oklahoma. So it was a way to try to get rid of the rest of the Seminole Indians that were here in Florida. Um, so after the Armed Occupation Act, which basically was about three to four years before it became, they deemed it successful. To give you an idea, I had a few notes written down, I'll give you some figures on the, uh, they had actually turned out a thousand, at the end of the Armed Occupation Act, they turned out a thousand one hundred eighty-four permits were issued and distributed which meant uh, they had actually set aside 200,000 acres of land and out of that permits that it took up 189,440 acres of the land. Uh, 128 were denied for technical reasons and 60 people after being here for five years and trying to accomplish their goal decided they didn't want to live in Florida and they went back home. <laughs> so, they basically, when it became a state in 1845, Florida was in two sections. You had East Florida, and then you had uh, West Florida. So another thing to improve, improve and entice people to move in was, of course, become a state. Because then you had laws, you had people enforce laws. 
Then you had uh, something I skipped over before that became the state was they had established two offices here in the state of Florida so you could register for your land that you were applying for during the Armed Occupation Act. One office was in Noonansville, Florida, which was northeast of Gainesville by 10 miles. It's not there anymore. The other office was St. Augustine. So can you imagine if you come down here, you establish your property and go through the trouble to improve it, and then you put on the permit, and you didn't have to have it surveyed. You could say it was by the edge of this creek and it went over to so-and-so's land or to this Indian town and such, and then get it to the office. Well, they allowed other people so the people would get together and let one guy take their permits to either St. Augustine or Newmansville and register them so they were basically had the titles to their land at the end of the five years. When it became a state, and of course there was more towns coming up and being populated, so the enticement of Pioneer didn't have to carry all the stuff that we discussed earlier. There was trading posts established all through the state. After the Civil War, they set up quite a few forts to help with the soldiers. Those forts had trading posts on them. One of the rules of the Occupation, the Armed Occupation Act, is you couldn't take land that was within two miles of a fort, and you couldn't take an island or a port or any area that was strategically military. So when it became a state, a lot of people started moving in even more than the Armed Occupation Act. Here's an example you can see. It's also log, but you can see some sawn boards, or they were throw boards, and then this actually has a shingle roof where a lot of the early um, dwellings, I mean, you just have to imagine, any, any of y'all like to watch uh, Alone series? And you see the shelter, you have to imagine, what kind of shelter would you build, you know? Would you try to get elaborate, or would you just keep it simple and work on other things because there's a lot to do on taking a piece of land and occupying it, clearing it, and improving it. And then another thing that the ad had on it is you could not cut the trees and sell them. You could only cut the trees on your property to make buildings and fences. Oh, that wow. kept people. The government was pretty smart because they knew people real well and they didn't want people just to come in and timber it and sell it. So you had to use it, use it to build something practical. Next one. Then we had the, the Civil War. That, at that period there, of course, I think there was like 2,000 people left Florida to join the Union troops, and a thousand of them were slaves that had moved, went up to join the Union Army up there. And a thousand uh, people that had settled in Florida because of the conflict decided to go north and side with the Union. The, uh, the important thing about Florida was, of course, the, the cattle that the Spanish had left here the horses and then the agriculture that had been established was what basically supported the, the Confederate states in their venture to go against the, the Union it was, uh, over the slavery issue. And Florida's main thing was to uh, supply salt and meat and food for the soldiers. The Union would be the next one, I think. Um, as you can see here, there were very few battles in Florida. You had a one up by Mariana at the Natural Bridge. You had a Lusty. You had a small one in Gainesville. And then there was one at Lake, um, down near Miami, I think. But you see that the blockade, this was Union, and they were trying to keep anything coming in, but there were still uh, blockade runners that brought in guns and supplies from various countries and managed to get by the blockade. So they controlled this pretty much the whole time. And um, was not successful, but they did they did enough that it did damage the ability for the, the South. When the South started, they had a really good foothold, were doing well. But by the time the blockade stopped the supplies, then the war started to dwindle. They had different opportunities. There were still people coming down here for opportunities during the war, and there's few people had left. And the Reconstruction brought a lot of people in because as the Federals had established herself here, they had taken over Tallahassee at the end of the Civil War, and um, they were trying to rebuild. So one of the things that made a lot of people come into Florida as pioneers at this period was due to the fact of all the destruction from the war, because there were buildings that were burnt down, they were uh, basically damaged during battles, cannon fire and such. 
so the demand for timber was really high. And so you could either come down here and get into the timber industry, which was going to be eventually turned into lumber and boards for rebuilding. And many of the um, products that were produced here in Florida were shipped back up north out of the port. So you could have a job working in the port. So it was a, it was a reason to entice people to come to Florida and help with the reconstruction. Now the railroad expansion, this is a, of course you see here we got Silver Springs and you can see the rail line here and then we had the, the boats, which the boats were the biggest method until the railway come in and the, the railway just enhanced the amount of people coming into Florida, made it a lot easier than going by boat. And they could bring in more goods and with more goods it enticed more people to move to Florida to, to develop the area, more farming, more timbering, etc. You had two major players, and the reason they got involved was just like the Armed Occupation Act, because the government said, well, we need to, to figure out how to get people to put into the infrastructure without us spending the money. So the government was willing to give them land at an extremely cheap price, and sometimes they gave it to them for free. So you had uh, Mr. Flagler and Mr. Plant, both were wealthy people, they were both into railroading and building, and Flagler pretty much just established his uh, system down the east coast of Florida while Henry Plant established the west coast of Florida. And uh, the, uh, you can see the, I, the, the railroads are sell pretty much <coughs> down both sides and then of course intersect to important ports. Uh, port of Tampa was one of the, um, actually Cedar Key was actually a better port than Tampa was, <coughs> but Tampa's had been established back in the, the Spanish, you know, as far as a place to shelter in the bay. So, and Henry Flagler took his railroad all the way down to the Keys, which was the main shipping uh, area down there, and this made it easier to bring different goods in that came from different countries and coming into the Key West. This was Plant's Hotel, which is now the University of Tampa, and this is, see the building that thing back at that day, that was an elaborate structure. And that was a hotel. And Henry Flagler, of course, had the ones in St. Augustine, which is now a uh, university over there. And this is now a university here. And still standing and still functional. That's just amazing, because our houses don't last that long. <laughs> so we have to be impressed by the building. Now, we had a lot of people moving into Florida. So they had to figure out how to make more land available. So the Everglades was basically uninhabitable. It was basically a river of grass. What much you could do with it, it was hard to negotiate. Matter of fact, during the Third Civil War, that's what the, uh, and that was at this period, just before this period, the, uh, the few Indians that was left down there, the Seminoles, the soldiers tried to constantly harass them and they just couldn't successfully do it because of the Everglades. They come up with the idea of digging the ditches and draining it, of course, with Flagler's Railroad, he brought in big heavy equipment. They were able to dig the canals and drain the Everglades and then turn it into agricultural land. And today, we know that most of our sugar comes from down there because the biggest sugar plantations are in the, it basically are in the world is uh, the one in the Everglades. So they turned it into basically a sugar cane plantation, but it was also celery, uh, cotton, other kinds of crops were grown on it. It had to overcome a lot of obstacles. They found out that the muck was a challenging thing to grow in because if you drained it, now it became dry and you're out there farming it. It basically would drop down about two to three feet every few years because of the way the material was made up. And they actually had to learn to add different things to it because it didn't have enough copper in it and a few other uh, minerals and uh, elements to, to make plants grow well. So uh, what we're here now is basically at the end of this, we'll do, I'll show you the tools and stuff and discuss about the, the things that the pioneers carried with them as they came in. But as we were talking about pioneers, Florida still ha has a lot of pioneers. We have our, our space agency, which is you know constantly growing. And of course, everybody has a cell phone. So we have all the communication things that are necessary by satellite, the cell phones from a cell phone tower 
Medical Research, we got Shands Hospital, Moffitt Cancer Center, mm -hmm. Military Research and Development in Florida. They're pioneering things all the time here in Florida, you know, such as uh, Mark Marietta and Boeing and Grumman are here. They all are working constantly improve uh, aircraft and the military. The Agriculture and Cattle, the University of Florida has a huge, the IPIS system there. They're constantly uh, bringing in new methods of fertilizer and uh, how to manage the land in a proper manner so we don't have the runoff, we don't have the nitrates in the, the rivers and destroying that. The horse industry and a lot of other small various uh, industries that are improving our lives every day. So this, that's our pioneers we have today. We all have opportunities to be a pioneer of one kind or another. So think about that. All right, so think about how would you approach the fact that now you've got the opportunity to come to Florida and you're going to come down here. Now, are you going to bring your wife and kids or are you going to come by yourself? Okay. A lot of people did it both ways. And a lot of women were left up in their uh, in areas like in Alabama and Georgia and such, and the husbands and brothers and all would get together and come to Florida. Depending on how much money you had, what you could afford, if you could get a wagon that was good size, a team of good animals, it, uh, it was endless what you could carry. Most of the things you see, the tools, everything you had, this is what we call a buck saw or a bow saw. This is a, a single man saw, but it is a, has a handle that can be put on it so it can be a two man saw. If you're gonna timber a lot of trees to cut down, cypress to make shingles and stuff, it would be nice to have a PV to roll it over instead of trying to roll it by hand. This was used to, to go around the log and when you pinched it, you could roll it over to cut the limbs and trim it off. A set of tongs was better than wrapping rope around it every time you needed to move a tree. So you would basically open this up, set this on the tree, attach the rope to this and use your animal to pull the tree up where you could work at it. Of course, the saw would cut the tree down. The P would allow you to cut the, uh, the limbs and such off. Some of the tools you would use to work the trees, this is a fro. You could actually use, use this to split shingles because as I told you about the roof that was covered with shingles, this is how you had to do it. So once the logs were cut into sections, cypress was your main wood for things like shingles and, and splitting into boards because it split really nice. This would be driven into the board with the mallet, and then you would work it back and forth and it would split. And you just work it down and split it. You get a shingle or a board off of this. Work a different tools. Things were pinned together. This is what the uh, auger would have been for, was to drill a hole. Then we would use the, the fro to split square pieces. We would use this to bring them down to a round dowel. Uh, of course, you know, if you're fortunate enough to get a Peg and nails and bring with you, it saved you from doing a lot of the pegging that went with it. Um, gouges, these were <coughs> mortise gouges here, so you could do square pegs. Uh, different types of chisels for shaping and working the wood, clamps to hold things in place while you worked on them with the wood. This was a very important item, it was a string for with a bob because it could be used like a level and to um, basically get your areas the same when you're building a, a cabin. Uh, canvas was important. This would be something you had lots of because canvas was used to make shelters and it was used to carry stuff in. Rope, because making rope you could be done. Like I said, if your, your spirit was good enough and your drive was good enough, you could probably come down with a gun, your provisions for you to cook and eat and an axe, and there is stories I've read through the different places, like Fort McCoy's got a book on history in there, and there was a gentleman that come down with nothing but an axe. He didn't even come with a gun. Basically had a thing to shoe him a place to stay in, he had canvas, he had his personal item, but then once he got to Fort McCoy, he worked for everybody else. And then he would take his labor that he got, well, he got paid, most of it was in trade. He would borrow tools, he would get the things necessary for his place, and he ended up becoming a preacher and uh, got married and, and all, but he came down with an axe. So it shows you it could be done. 
And of course, you determine on one thing, how much money you have, what could you spend on, what could you carry if you get an animal of burden. And believe me, it was the, we were talking about the cattle and the horses that the Spanish left. Well, that was another big drive. It wasn't just owning land. There was people that came down here just to round up the cattle that the Spanish had left and the horses, and they sold them, and then they used that to purchase things they needed. They were just had the experience to do that. There was plenty, actually. There was an Indian here during the 1760s in Gainesville at Payne's Prairie. That was the town of um, Tuscaloosa. He was known as Cowkeeper. He had the largest amount of Spanish cattle rounded up. William Bartram came all the way over from Palaka to, to meet him and see his operation, which Bartram was amazed by the amount of cattle he had amount of people he had and how well managed and how well taken care of Payne's Prairie was. That was a notable thing in Bartram's travels was the, uh, the Indian chief uh, cowkeeper. Um, so with the uh, fact of the, pretty much Florida getting populated to the max and like I said still pioneers today. Uh, does anybody got any questions? Robert, I remember you telling me about where the canvas came from and jeans. Okay, yeah. Which is an interesting bit of trivia. Yeah, we can go over a few things like that. Because the canvas, you gotta realize, what was the major mode of transportation of getting here from Europe? Sailboats, Sail right? Ships, big ships. And those ships, the bigger they were, the bigger their sails were. Okay, one thing about being a successful captain, a successful person working on a ship, is to keep that ship from getting floundered or sinking. And so changing sails was like changing tires. So they would look at the grommets, they look at the overall condition, and when it got where it was not good enough for that ship, it had to be taken down and replaced. And they usually carried two extra set of sails on the ship to replace everything they needed to replace. But you didn't throw it away, you didn't throw it beside the ship. That was one of the biggest trade items that come off the ship that was basically already paid for, was the sails. And so they would use that canvas. Matter of fact, the Spanish, their introduction of canvas changed the way the Plains Indian lived. Because the Plains Indian had been using buffalo, antelope, and other hides for their teepees. By the time they had their conflict with Custer, there was only three teepees made out of hides. All the rest were made out of canvas. And all that canvas came from the trade with Spanish and Britons from the, the sails of the ship. Huh? What material was canvas made? It's cotton. cotton. The Egyptians had been weaving cotton for 2,000 years. And matter of fact, they pretty much, the trade amongst Egypt and India, cotton was huge over there. And that's what they used for their clothing. And canvas is just heavy clothing. Matter of fact, our jeans, our Levi jeans, if you know the story, Mr. Levi went west during the expansion to go out there because of the gold rush. And most of the miners that were wearing wool clothes, that was woven wool, it wasn't holding up. It was coming basically and fall apart and fall off you. Well, Levi was a tent maker originally. He had no clue that he was gonna get in the clothing business. So with the miners needing pants that would hold up, he was taking the canvas, which was the sail canvas off the ship, and he was cutting it out and sewing them up clothes and then he would rivet the stress points because the miners bending over constantly working in there. And so the canvas is where Levi was his main material for making his jeans. And they dyed it with one of the things that was manufactured here in Florida, I didn't get to touch on, but the, uh, the Spanish had brought indigo here from the Asian islands for a dye. And they, uh, they brought the indigo here to produce it, to sell it. Well, the British, when they had Florida from 1760 to 1780, the British really liked your colors. They loved the yellows, the blues, the reds, and indigo blue was one of the most desirable. And they basically, when the British were here from 1760 to 1780, they had the demand for indigo so high across the world that it actually brought more money than gold. You could buy gold cheaper than you could indigo dye at that period. And that's what Mr. Levi used to dye his blue jeans because it was a nice color that they didn't look so bad after they were worn for like six months or so. <laughs> so you could walk into a store and be kind of presentable, you know? 
Because if it was still white canvas, it didn't take much. It'd be real dirty. Anyway, I'll take questions. Obviously, the um, white settlers that painted the Florida couldn't just stop over at Winn Dixie and buy groceries. No. Nope. They had to learn. They learned the, the, the land. And, and so one, of, one of the things I read getting prepped up for this was all your settlers brought, you know, chickens and a milk cow usually, some sort of oxen or something to produce milk. And chickens, they weren't slaughtered because there was plenty of turkeys, there was plenty of game that they could hunt or trap. And that's the thing I bring here was, you know, traps were a necessity because it gave you time to be working on your farm instead of hunting. You can still have sustainable food by trapping it. And so there was quite a bit of that. And then it became commercial. But traps were usually used to supplement without having to hunt. And uh, so it dried, of course, no one had a forge. And, and people that lived up in Georgia and Alabama had already been pretty much prepped. And, and about half of, we were talking about the Army Occupation Act, a half of the people that come in and got permits were from Georgia, Alabama, and areas like that. There was even a few Spanish that had stayed over from when it became Spanish territory, British, Spanish, and back became the U.S. territory that actually stayed here. And one gentleman had a, um, he was a fisherman, and he was in Tampa at 1824. He come well established, but he didn't apply for his land until the Armed Occupation Act, so he applied for his property at that time. But he was a Spanish, originally a Spanish person from, that period. So my question was, they, oh, had to learn, they had to learn how to plant things and grow things. Right. Which, which is, but Florida's climate is harsh. Well, it's also uh, dry, hurricane, storm. How much interaction was there with the native people? And well, how much transfer of knowledge? From the that was very short, because you got to realize when basically we're talking about uh, when it came to territory, they were already trying to, you know, move, persuade the Indians out. That was some of the treaties that were already going on is to talk them to moving out to Oklahoma. A lot of them didn't want to do it. So it would have been before that, because when the Spanish were here and the British were here, they had a lot of interaction with the, the Indians here. They basically built the, the forts and they also built uh, like churches, mm -hmm. the missions, you would say, the Spanish missions. And so that was when the Indians basically told them and you know their knowledge and everything else. When it became a territory, there was a lot of conflict. And so I'm not saying I could tell you how many had friended Indians here in Florida and had probably got that knowledge from them. But a lot of people that come in came from other areas, like where the Creek Indians were in Georgia and Alabama, they would have learned stuff from them. And it's just like I said, part of being a pioneer, overcoming things that are thrown at you. Things you don't even basically can't learn. You just have to figure it out. And that's what pioneer spirit is. It's the ability to, to take your experiences in life. And when you go to a new area, new territory, successfully engage it and successfully get through it and prosper. Robert, you said that a lot of the pioneers were coming from Georgia and Alabama. Carolina, a lot of them from Carolina. So the agriculture wouldn't have been tremendously different. No, is this finding the right place? One of the things I read about with the end of the armed occupation is some of the senators and other people that were basically trying to see how successful it was were surprised about how many people chose poor land when just a few miles away was better land. And so they kind of, and they had a rule that once you had the 160 acres and that you for the permit that was yours so if you ended up with an area that had swamp land it was yours you couldn't negotiate it and trade it back out and that's what they were talking about they were surprised at how many people made poor choices but that's because they didn't know florida they were from georgia and alabama where things are different hilly clay whole different things so it was just the inexperience they got out there and i mean it's, it's going on now they looked around and went this looks good i think i'll stay here and then when the weather changes it's like what did i do <laughs> yeah, this was not a good idea. Was there a stipulation on when they gave, they said that they could come down and get land, it was just from so far to so far? Yeah, and it basically they were enticing people because there's a lot of people moved into Florida um, during the, when it became a territory. They, they estimate about 20,000 people came into Florida from Georgia, Alabama, and Carolinas 
when it got established as a U.S. territory, but they all stayed in the Panhandle area, basically from Jacksonville all the way over to Pensacola because there was a lot of access for good. So it was like, you know, how far away do you want to get from some place that you need something? So now to entice them, and it's just like, uh, I don't think I went over these fishers, but to give you an idea, during the time of the Armed Occupation Act, 1842, they had done some censuses, census, 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 people count. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lips and Mr. Tony Gergen. 1830 to 1840, I want to give you the statistics of the growth of people that immigrated, migrated, and moved into Alabama from 1830 to 1840 increased 200,000. Missouri increased 220,000. Michigan got 190,000 people in 10 years. Illinois got 320,000 people in 10 years. Ohio got 600,000 people in 10 years. So you can see people were really moving and being pioneers in other places and Florida had to try to convince them to come down here. Florida in that 10 years got 19,700 people. Okay? Now does that tell you what they thought about Florida back then between the mosquitoes, Panthers, the Bears, the Red Wolves, the Indians, and all the other things they had to overcome, it didn't have a real enticing sign on it at the time to get 19,700 people. Yeah, so it took a lot more work. I have a comment and a question. My comment is, I, I thought your last slide on the PowerPoint was fascinating. How you said he considered us today as pioneers yeah. because I don't think <coughs> And I think that is brilliant to um, give credit of what is still happening today. And, and all of us can do it. I mean, it, what, at the moment you pick something out, like I picked out history, and I'm, I'm just born, I mean, I got 23 years in it. I don't usually do this. This is new to me. <laughs> so I'm pioneering my lectures, okay? So I'm a pioneer in lectures right now. And we all can, it doesn't matter. If you pick something out to pursue that is uncomfortable and new to you, and you pursue it, and you succeed at it, I don't care if it's recycling, I don't care if it's talking about you going down and, and getting involved with how to make you know the laws to make everybody equal or make things work better, you still can be a pioneer, okay? It's just, it takes that, I don't know if I wanna do this, no, I'm gonna do it, you know, at whatever cost. And then, you know, to be a pioneer, you didn't have to be successful because like I told you, there was like 60 people gave up their five years of work, five years of effort, and they gave it up and walked away. It was just too much. They didn't want to live here. But they were still pioneers. They made it five years, you know, and we're back to the whole thing. It's like being on the loan. Yeah, if you made it three days, I don't know if I can give you a star, but you got somebody who made it 89 days and the next person made it 91, they were awful close, you know. Succeeding. Well, my question is, what is that point was, how did the pioneers deal with the mosquitoes and the ticks? Well, like the Indians, you got to realize, you know, the indigenous people here have been 12 to 15,000 years in Florida, and they had learned to use different herbs, and they used a lot of smudge fires, a lot of, you know, and they had their camps, and then they were in the mosquito season, they'd have smudge fires going to keep the smoke around, and then, of course, being on the move helped, but I, I'd say I was up at Robin Reservoir two days ago, and I could not believe how bad the mosquitoes were. <laughs> that's the first thing that crossed my mind. It's, you know, could I, and I used to coon hunt it, so I can tell you, because you can imagine what it was like to spend the night here in Florida. So you got a wagon full of stuff. You got your wife, you got three, four, five, six kids, whichever. You ain't unloading that wagon to sleep in it. Because you got too much stuff in there. Now we're back to the canvas and blankets and the necessities that you took with you. You get underneath mm -hmm. your wagon and spend the night. Then you gotta listen, it starts out, you're the noisiest animal in the woods when you got there. You're doing all this clanking and the horses moving around and everything. You get dinner cooked, you get fed. This is all before dark. We didn't have flashlights and lanterns weren't much. You know, there's a little candlelight going on. And then you lay down and next thing you know, you hear a panther yell, a squall, you know? And then you hear a bear, you know, kind of grunting and growling. And then you got pigs left over from the Spanish that are coming up, checking you out. It's total dark, you know? You're not gonna keep the candle burning. You might keep a candle burning all night, 
You had to be pretty. I used to coon hunt. I had to sleep by trees quite a bit, waiting for my dogs to come back. And you would hear all kinds of stuff after you turn your headlight off. And you get quiet, and it's their turn. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, what happened to mosquito nets? The Egyptians had been weaving uh, that type of cloth 2,000 years ago. And so if you were lucky, smart enough, you'd have to invest the money in a mosquito net. When was Fort King established and um, what was relevant about it? Well, the thing was it's basically with the Seminole Indians and Osceola was based out of here, this area, was the, well, this was the main bed of Indian activity. And so you had forts all the way, you had Fort Brook in Tampa, Fort Clinch in Jacksonville, you had Fort McCoy where I live at, you had Fort Russell, you had Fort Butler, there, usually within a day's march, there was a fort to soldiers to stay in while they were trying to get the Indians to leave. Fort King was one of the bigger ones because it was like halfway between Fort Brook and, and Fort Clinch. And so it, I think it was built three times. It was, uh, twice? Okay, yeah. It, and the third time it was torn down, I think, and used to make courthouse or whatever, but it was burnt down twice, wasn't it? And it was burnt down one time and then rebuilt and all the wood is now, the wood is on the top now. Okay. And so it was necessary to kind of Try to keep the Indian, you know, get the Indians removed. I grew up in Central Florida, about 20 miles, 30 miles east of here. We, in each county, there was somebody that was a big landowner who, what my folks would say, got a land grant. Like the Strong's own Lucia County, with another Strong own uh, Seminole County, and I don't know the name of who was over here, but there were people here that had great amounts of land. Now, I'll, after your presentation, I figured out how my folks got three plots of 160 acres, which is all land. I figured that out. <laughs> 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 anyway, how did that happen? You talking about the big grants? No, yeah. The yeah. big land grants over yeah, 160 yeah, yeah. I believe that was during the Spanish. A lot of them were Spanish land grants. Yeah, the, the historic families would make a foothold sell cattle, get rich, and buy, buy all the land around them. Yeah, yeah. My, my father would say they're land poor because they spent all their, they owned all this land and it wasn't useful. Today they're multi, multi-millionaire. We're back to how things change, you know. Yeah, yeah. Doing it it's also amazing too, if you look at, well, not current map, maps, but in the, in the uh, early 1900s, you still see these swaths of Spanish land grants, usually around the Those springs, like, right over by the, Salt Springs, Salt springs. Silver Glen, Astor, yeah. you, you'll still see the Rodriguez, and it would be a thousand acres. And so that's what the Spanish had done. Here you go. Yeah, the same you know, kind of idea as far as here. I, I can't it. remember the gentleman's name in Tampa, but it's kind of, you know, he didn't have thousands of acres, but he'd been there and stayed after the Spanish, you know, had left it on the, the second time they were here. And then you, you, nobody kept any really good records on all the different people that were still here. Like the Menorcans are well known in St. Augustine and the Menorcans were brought by the Spanish to work the plantation. And they found Florida very satisfiable. They didn't have an issue staying here. Now, if you read any of the thing about the British period, 1760, 1780, whether it's Orman, Bulo, um, the numerous uh, British who were here, they didn't want to be here in the summertime. They went back home and stayed gone. And then they'd come back, at least somebody in charge of their plantation, and they would go back, and then when they, the weather started to get better, they were your first true snowbirds. So they, they'd come back, and they would hunt, fish, make sure everybody was doing their job, it was being profitable. Soon, first sign of a lot of mosquitoes and the heat, they went back home. Well, yeah, the Cracker Cowboys, the Cracker Culture. Right, but did they um, use the riverboats too? Oh yeah, I forgot to touch on that, but yeah, river transportation was still, a lot of people, even like William Bartram, uh, he, he did most of his travels by boat, but he also went horseback. He traveled from over in the St. John's area, Palaka, traveled all the way over to uh, Manatee Springs and all that area there. But he did that by horse. But, he, and then, but when he got over there, he actually borrowed a canoe from some Indians and he 
to move that whole area and kept, he, he had carried a journal and I, I want to touch on something that amazes me because as much as I reenact and the things I do and the times I spend in the camp here at Silver River and some of the places I've camped at, William Bartram traveled around and he was an artist and a journalist. So he's carrying a bunch of paper and a lot of art supplies. How do you keep it from getting soaking wet and getting destroyed? So I got to figure that out because I want some boxes or some bags or something like that. He spent weeks out on the boat, weeks on the horseback and he managed to send his artwork and his journals and stuff back to his uh, benefactor, Father Gill. So that was big. To me, that's one of the biggest mysteries how to keep everything dry. Canvas. <laughs> yeah, canvas. And a lot of beeswax. Anybody else? So oh, when I grew up in Kansas, we learned about how the government had marked off all these sections yeah, of the land. Grids nice little grid spaces and stuff and uh, the the, uh, set, the white settlers could come in and claim this section. Yeah, what's that? What you're talking about in Florida it doesn't sound like there's been any organized. No, you, you can come in and pick it out on your own. But how do you mark it off and make sure it's not overlapping? Well, that, else yeah, it was your job. They, it was one of the things that was expressed <laughs> when they told everybody about the mm -hmm. Armed Occupation Act is you couldn't take any land that had already been occupied. So you had to make sure most people went in and would blaze their trees and then they check in the area and by the time they start working, somebody shows up and says, what are you doing on my property? Well then, now it comes down to negotiation <laughs> or relocation, because they didn't uh, require, that was the one thing I found unusual, they didn't require it to be surveyed. You just had to have particular points that you could identify your property by. And of course, you, one, one application was turned down because he had 163 acres instead of 160. Oh, yeah. So they, that was one of the ones that got kicked out. So you had to make sure you could do your math and figure out the best way to do that math when you get your property up, or it could be kicked out. Like it would tell you how many had gotten kicked out for technicality. When statehood happened, they started sending government survey crews in. Yep. But it took many, many years, obviously, to begin to plan out and survey. That came later, and a lot of those really early survey maps still show things like a, a old Indian field, or it'll, you know, have features uh, that that we would think were in the long distant past. But if you're a surveyor in the 1840s, you know, you're, you'll stumble across a place that used to be Osceola's town, uh, and so a lot of those clues will show up on those early survey maps. They're, they're treasure troves of information about where things used to be. This occupation act was before the one out west, correct? Yeah. Mm How -hmm. come more people didn't come down than they came in? Because that one was full of people. Probably because of the things about the mosquitoes and the mosquitoes. Because they read some of the accounts. <laughs> they what it was back then. Yeah, but that was just as hard out yeah. west. Jacksonville, Pensacola, that, those areas there. Right. The ports were your biggest ones, Tampa, Miami, uh, any place they could get a ship in. St. Augustine. How about the inner part of Florida? How Mickey about some of the yeah. Huh? Yeah, Micanopi, because that was the big hot spot during the yes. Civil Indian War. And so, I, I've been, basically, I, it's funny, I was going through Hawthorne the other day and I stopped because I love the historical marker. So if I can instill something into you, when you see a historical marker, if you can go get it without killing somebody, go back and read it, you know? And I passed one downtown Hawthorne and that town was established in 1880. Uh, but people had come there earlier and it was two people that seen the, the opportunity to make money and it was off of timber and lumber, okay. trees and such, and then they were having the railroad come through and they did great. So Hawthorne got established and then another railroad come through that was bigger and better, so it kind of wiped it out and became kind of a backwater town then. Mm -hmm. So. I was just gonna add there, I'm trying to find a picture of it as far as Rod Eva Ranch. 
No, he's a ranch. Yeah, there's a marker there, and yeah. there was a Civil War skirmish yeah, there. Yeah, you know, that's the first place in that area there that the, actually the, the cavalry yeah. took over a boat that, that conquered the Navy. So the cavalry had shot the rudder on the Union boat and ran it into the bank and captured it. So that's the first time a naval vessel had been captured by the cavalry. <laughs> so Battle of Horse Landing. So um, wasn't the, the road from Fort Brooke to Fort King like really the first road in, down in the fog? All your roads were pretty much established off of Indian trails where the Indians had been trading and stuff like the, down when you get in Tampa where Weed Island is, the pottery and stuff. The Indians traded amongst each other, especially up here on the Tamuquin because they, you know, the Calusa was the, there were hunter gatherers and the Takista and then Appalachia, but the Tamuquins were the biggest group and they did a lot of trade. And so those trails had already been established and when the Spanish got here, they followed those Indian trails. And then they improved them, made them wider so they could pull their wagons. And from that point on, it was just constant improvement. So a lot of your roads today come from roads that were established from Indian trails. And of course, commerce, the highest amount of commerce going from one place to another. And of course, Tampa Bay to Jacksonville. So. Accents. <clears throat> yeah. I see a lot of different accents. Yeah. That's the purpose of one person. Well, various things. This is broad as here. This was for, for hewing the logs, okay, to get them square and flat. And it's shaped like that so you can work the, get a nice square cut surface on it. This is a general, this is like a tomahawk or a Viking. It's basically a general purpose, personal standard axe head, they were double bit and such. This was mainly for falling the trees and starting notches and doing crude work. And then other stuff like this was for finishing work, cutting out troughs and such. So there, I, there, there's about half of what was available back then at the time. I could, there's just no way I could bring all the stuff that they would have used in that period. And the wealthier you were and the more resources you had, the more you could carry. It determined how fast and uh, labor saved you and made it for yourself to become successful. And that was the goal of a lot of people. Like I said, between the cattle and the land, you could become a wealthy person by just showing up with, I mean, it probably took every penny you had from wherever you came from, and that was a chance you took. Like I said, can you imagine that decision you had to make at that time to do this venture? And that is the true pioneer spirit. You just decided to do something. You may lose it all, you may die, you don't know till you do it. Can you imagine going home and telling your wife, hey, we're going to hop in this wagon? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Robert. Yeah, Robert, as we, uh, as we wrap up here, um, I think we should recognize Fort King and, and Samantha and mention your right. cast iron cooking just briefly. And then if people want to come up and and look at things up close yeah. as we wrap up. I think there's that Yeah, make sure, uh, we have a lot of wonderful things, resources around here. Fort King is becoming, a, I mean, I did quite a few visits over there. I did cast iron cooking. Uh, we got a wood fired pizza oven. We even have uh, little get togethers and learn how to do pizzas in that pizza oven, which I think is fantastic. <laughs> pizza. Hi, uh, my name is Samantha. I didn't mean to, but I wanted to see you anyway, because I haven't in a while, but um, so Robert will, will be back at Fort King on September 16th. It is a cast iron cooking class from September to 12, so you can register online and you get your whole nice lunch uh, ready to go with a bunch of other folks. And oh, it'll be okay. perfect. That's the, whole I mean, second, that's the whole second part of the talk is the food. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go to Fort King in September for that. Yeah. And I'd like to thank Scott for helping me with my program here. Like I said, this is new to me. I'm a pioneer. I mean, and I can, I'll take anything you can throw at me for what I could improve it too. Because this is, like I said, I think this is maybe my third or fourth attempt at like this. Because usually I set up a camp and you come into my house and you ask me questions and I answer them. So trying to stay on track and not get derailed and everything. And so Scott helped me win so many this is fantastic job. Well, we, we think you did great, Robert. You're welcome. <laughs> And like I said, make sure you make it over to Fort King. Yep, and I also need to thank Martha Lynn Allen for organizing these talks. She went out and found all of our speakers. Martha Lynn and Candy, raise your hand, Candy. They work on the weekend. And uh, 
so Martha Lynn and Candy are our weekend staff, and um, Martha Lynn was the, the lead on finding speakers for the hot months in the summertime where we get to enjoy the AC, and then starting next month in September, you all will be organizing uh, bi-monthly every second and fourth weekend, I believe, it's um, Pioneer Village Tours on Saturday. So we do that in the cooler months, we work inside in the hotter months. So. Anyway, Robert, do you want to um, open it up for show and tell? If people yeah. want to come up and look, we yeah, can thank everybody up. for coming. Yeah. Martha Lynn, our next talk is two weeks. Yes, two weeks from today, and it will be about uh, McMahon. McMahon? Uh, Darcy McMahon. Darcy McMahon from the University of uh, Florida will be talking about the boat. I mean, the, uh, sorry. <laughs> The uh, dugout canoe exhibit that we have here, but also her new exhibit that's coming up in the university. Oh, this.